if I'm in a senior level executive team meeting, maybe I propose that we work through the problem by starting with future state success. Like, what does it look like if we get this right, guys? What does it look like if we solve the problem? What is the future? And then we work backwards by identifying, we agree on what success is, what are the obstacles, what can we do to eliminate the obstacles, and who's accountable for um, those those plans. So it's this, it's it's an idea of creating a conversation where we're talking about solving the problem and we're not necessarily getting into who did what, when, and where. This is the Workplace Therapist Podcast, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith. I'm really excited to be back in the studio again, uh, and excited for some updates on the show. So, um, one update is we have changed, thanks to your help, we've changed our tagline, changed our focus. So, our focus on the show now is going to be this, helping you improve your conversations and relationships at work. I love that. Randy, don't you love that? I do. It, it kind of it kind of helps us focus, and really relevant for our topic today. Today, we're going to be talking about candor. I've got my good friend uh, and partner and colleague, Randy Hain, joining me today, talking about something he's particularly passionate about, candor. Um, but I do have another update. If you haven't seen, I'm really proud and pleased to announce my first book launched, The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in a World Where Everything is Urgent All of the Time. So if you haven't checked that out or got your copy, you can get that on Amazon, or you can go to my site, theworkplacetherapist.com, and you have two choices. You can buy a copy via Amazon, or uh, for a little bit more, you can get a personalized copy, and I'll I'll, I'll handwrite a note to you and, and drop it in the mail to you. So lots of updates today, Randy. It's yeah. always it's good when you got new stuff happening, particularly today when there's so much kind of changing. Well, you had me at candor because I love that I love that topic. <laughs> By the way, I will tell everyone that uh, I have read your book and it is outstanding. And you should not only read it for yourself, but buy five copies and give them to your friends. I didn't pay him to say that, by the way. <laughs> just so everyone knows, like he just said that on his own. Uh, but thank you. Yeah, it was really, it was, a, you know, the process of writing the book was uh, challenging. Uh -huh. It took me three years to mm -hmm. kind of get that thing from beginning to end. And but it's I, so relevant. Well, it, that was the reason why I yeah, wrote it. Yeah. You know, urgency. Just everyone seems yeah. to be dealing with that. Everything seems to be a fire all the time. Mm -hmm. And you and I both talk to our clients all the time about trying to get them mm -hmm. from being in the business to on the business. Mm -hmm. Right? Stop being a firefighter. Mm -hmm. Learn how to delegate. Learn how to be strategic and get yourself kind of above those flames. And that's kind of what the book's all about. Well, um, enough to, enough about the book. There'll be more where we'll talk about the book in, in future shows, but definitely check it out if you haven't gotten your copy. As you can tell, I'm super passionate about it. Um, but Randy, for our topic today, I really want to spend some time on this thing um, that we call candor. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into that, for folks that are new to you, mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about you. I'm the president and founder of a company called Servium Partners, and I'm an executive coach and leadership consultant. You and I do very similar work, uh, and also the co-founder with you of the Leadership Foundry, and we do customized uh, leadership development engagements for high potentials in the middle layer of leadership at companies all over the country. Uh, and I'm also a writer and speaker and uh, husband and dad. And yeah. the last two are my, my favorites, actually. So. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. good. We were just talking about kind of vacations, yeah. and it just turns out that I got to visit one of your very favorite vacation spots in the world. Yes. And took all your recommendations and ate all that delicious food. It was well worth the time. In fact, my kids said, gosh, if we could have stayed another day or two, that would have been, that would have been great. Um, we talked about how dangerous it is, it, it is to make recommendations because if they had been horrible, you would have been really upset. <laughs> well, every <laughs> single recommendation, they said, well, Mr. Randy did it again. Oh, okay. Every, every, every time. So they were, feel good. Thank you. they were very pleased. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about this idea of candor. Sure. Uh, I know that's something that you and I talk about a lot. It's something mm -hmm. you're particularly uh, passionate about and skilled at. So um, having those candid conversations is tough. So let's, uh, yeah, I wrote down some notes here. I think a good starting place is I would love to hear your definition of candor. Mm -hmm. When somebody says, Randy, what does it mean to be candid? How, how do you, what's your, what's your thoughts around that? You know, I think at a surface level, um, I would define it as being honest, open, and direct. Um, but it goes deeper. You know, I think, uh, you know, it's easy to just to think about, okay, I need to have honest and open conversations and be more direct, but there's more to it. I, I think that we need to consider how we view candor. A lot of people are afraid of candor, and uh, and I think candor is a gift. 
I think candor if done well is an absolute gift and it's one of the things that makes business and teams work really, really well. So I think we need to um, not just define it, but also think about how do we, what's our perception about it? Is it positive or negative? A lot of people have a very negative perception of so, candor. So why is it a gift? Because candor, if delivered well and respectfully, um, can increase innovation. It can increase creativity. Um, it can be, make, more, uh, make you more efficient. Uh, there's so many benefits of being candid. Uh, here's an example. I would say that the lack of candor in business is absolutely pervasive. It is a pervasive issue in every company that I work with. It just is. And one of the th ways that it shows up is when people are not candid with each other. You have to have two, three, four conversations sometimes to get to the issue that you need to address. Uh, mm. Or people never get the truth from you about how you perceive their performance. Um, you know, that you're always telling people how amazing they are when you actually think they've got some things they need to work on. So developmentally, it hurts people. So there's so many downsides to not being candid. Uh, we could spend all day on that. But I think the lack of candor is pervasive, and it's something that I think you and I both, as you said, are passionate about trying to address with our clients. Okay, so we often talk about how bad meetings are in companies. Yes. So that's a huge issue. Would you say candor is even worse than, the lack of candor is even more problematic than dysfunctional meetings? Well, I think the lack of candor is one of the reasons why business meetings are so dysfunctional. Ah. So I think that you start with, um, you know, the, the purpose of the meeting. Why are we actually meeting? Um, the agenda, is it really the agenda we need to be talking about? In the meeting itself, are we actually having the conversations that we need to have? Um, are we trying to be politically correct? Are we uh, saying the things that actually need to be voiced out loud? Or are we keeping them to ourselves because we're fearful of, you know, of retribution? Um, you know, you and I have both read a lot about psychological safety, and there's often a lack of psychological safety in those meetings so people don't feel that they can be open and honest and direct. Yeah, okay. All right, so go back to your early definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, honest, open, and direct. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you've got me. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get it. It's mm -hmm. super important, and I can see that it, it, it helps to create innovation, mm -hmm. um, greater efficiency. Mm -hmm. Um, and healthier relationships. You didn't quite say it that way, but it really is because you know where you stand with people. Yes. Um, and I think that's really important. All those things are good. So, so why, don't, <laughs> why don't we do it? I think it goes back to the perception. People perceive direct conversations as bad. Why do they do that? Well, sometimes they're afraid that they'll say the wrong thing and offend someone. They're worried that if I'm candid, it might expose me. It might put me out there in a politically difficult position. Um, I might, um, you know, I might say something that hurts someone's feelings. I mean, there's a whole litany of reasons why people don't do it. Um, but for whatever reason, um, I think about all the businesses I've worked in for 30 years, and the lack of candor was always a significant issue. I really can't name a single company, and I certainly wouldn't do it out loud on the show, um, that does candor really well. I really don't know any company that does it well. There are pockets within companies that do it well. Certain leaders that really get it, that really grasp the concept of good candor done well, but typically companies don't do it well. Do you, I'm just curious about your perspective on this. Do you think there's regional differences? So is it harder to do candor in the Southeast or even if you kind of run down all through Texas where maybe people are a little more nice or more harmonious? Or, or does it really... We are very polite here in the South, yeah. Um, but I can't say that it's any different in any other companies I work with. I've got clients uh, Northeast. I've got a client on the West Coast. I think it's pervasive everywhere. Pervasive issue. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think one of the things that does maybe enable candor potentially to be done better in the South maybe is because there's more of a respectful tone sometimes in the way we do business. Uh, we are polite, but I think we're respectful. And I think you have to marry respect with candor for it to be done well. So it's not enough for me to be candid with you. I need to show you respect. I need to let you know that um, I care about your feelings. I, I, I want to deliver something that I hope that you'll take well, but I need to respect you as a person when I deliver that candid message. Yeah. And maybe because of the way we do business in the Southeast, that's easier. Yeah, I think that's. A, I think you make a really important distinction. Mm -hmm. You know, like we could we could probably make the case that most investment banking firms are candid but not in a respectful way. Right. Right. So I, I, we might not even call that candor. We might call that something else. But uh, yeah, you, you, we want to do it in a way that maintains the relationships and mm -hmm. is an effort to kind of uh, really be about the person mm -hmm. maybe. 
Mm -hmm. versus just you know yelling at someone because I'm unhappy. Mm -hmm. So uh, how can we do this better? Maybe that's a good a good starting place for this. And I know that's a big question, but you know if you were if you were to coach someone on how to mm -hmm. who wants to be candid, sure. What are some tips or practical steps they can take to get better at this? You know, I kind of look at fixing candor in companies like solving world hunger or world peace. <laughs> you need to turn. So it's easy. <laughs> it's real easy. You know, you have to kind of turn away from the desire to fix systemically um, the problem with candor in your company. You are probably not going to fix that in your entire organization. So what can you do? Think about the ripple effect of your actions towards others. How can I, as a leader, if I'm watching this show and I get what Brandon and Randy are talking about, maybe I can go out and model it better. Maybe I can just start with my own little circle. And if I get myself and my team, maybe the 5, 10, 15, 20 people on my team to do it well, then we can have a positive impact and a ripple effect on other leaders that we encounter. So my encouragement to anyone when I talk about candor is let's let's not focus on what the company's not doing well. Let's focus on what you need to do well. So I think it starts with modeling the behavior. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. Modeling it and creating that, uh, thinking about kind of your little pocket of influence. Yes. Right? What's my little pocket and how can I model it? Okay, so I want to model it. Yes. But I also want to make sure that everyone knows what I'm doing. Yes. Because if I start all of a sudden just being candid with people. Yes. You know, I, one of my favorite sayings is in absence of communication, people assume the worst. Yes. If I don't start telling people why I'm doing that, they're going to think, what, what's wrong with this guy? Yes. All of a sudden, he just told me that my performance isn't that great and mm -hmm. he didn't like this, this, and wants me to change this or mm -hmm. whatever happens to be. So how do you how do you do that? How do you create mm -hmm. an... Um, an environment that's ready for candor. Maybe that's a good way to say it. You know, I think you're right. You make a good point that all of a sudden, if you become the candid leader, people will look at you a little funny. So I think it's it's maybe more of a gradual effort. Um, you know, one of the ways you could do it is to think about how you give feedback. So, hey, listen, I want to talk to you about, you know, how you did on the project. I really appreciate these three or four things that were just done extremely well. There's probably one area that I think we could improve. Let's talk about what you can do differently and let me let me support you in that effort. It's something I've heard you say for years, you know, the five to one ratio of positive to negative feedback. But maybe uh, as a way to deliver a candid message to a colleague, we think about delivering performance feedback. Um, but I think, you know, kind of leading into, I love this, but there's something specific that you need to work on. Let's talk about that. Uh, and then also offer to help that person. That's one way to do it. Um, I think another is um, set the tone in team meetings. Uh, be willing to not only model giving candid feedback and, and, and facilitating a candid dialogue, but you have to be really careful if you're the leader to not punish people who speak out loud. Never punish, always reward. You know, we talked about psychological safety. You have to make sure that your teammates feel psychologically safe. So start speaking candidly in a meeting, and when you see someone else do it, <clears throat> even if you don't like what they have to say, go out of your way to praise them and thank them for the courage. Thank them for speaking up. Uh, either do it in the meeting or do it after the meeting, but you have to create an environment where people feel like, I'm not going to get shot if I bring a candid message. So not only modeling it and, and trying to work it into how you give feedback, but but recognize, I love this point too, recognizing when other people do it. Yes. And quickly celebrate that, reward that, mm -hmm. reinforce that. So mm -hmm. not only do they know it's okay, mm -hmm. but they know you like it. So they'll do it more. I know a common theme in our executive coaching work is we always talk to our leaders about building new muscles. So the only way to build new muscles is to exercise and practice, right? Uh, I'm probably not a good example of that. But when you think about candor, that's a muscle that has to be built and you have to exercise to grow it. So, you know, getting leaders to understand, or really anyone um, who's listening to the show, start thinking about, okay, I am going to start modeling this and I don't have to go all in. I don't have to be the master of candor by tomorrow, but I'm going to do little things. Uh, and then maybe a 30 days later, 60 days later, I can look back and see my progress. So maybe that's a, a great goal for anyone who's listening to the show. I can start small and build from there, but I've got to start practicing that. And one of the things I always tell people when they're thinking about, you know, being more candid, start with people where you know it's safe. You know, maybe start with a colleague where you're not in a pretty good relationship. Uh, I know that I can have an open, honest, direct conversation with them. Build up your confidence and then take that on the road and try it with other people. Yeah, I love that. I think it's great starting kind of with those people that uh, you already have that trust. Yes. Okay, so we're, we're about to go into break. When we come back from break, I want to talk about 
how do you do candor mm -hmm. in situations where you maybe just haven't had the time mm -hmm. to build trust mm -hmm. or there's just don't you don't feel like that's really established the way you want it to be mm -hmm. it could be like with maybe a colleague that maybe you just haven't been getting along well with but you want to improve the relationship mm -hmm. so so when we come back i'm going to get your thoughts on that can't wait so uh stay tuned we're going to break we'll be right back hey everybody thanks so much for listening to the show in case you haven't heard brandon's got a new book out he's going to tell you all about it Thanks, Emily. So the book is The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in a World Where Everything is Urgent All the Time. And if you're like me, and like most of us, everything does feel urgent all the time. It's like hot sauce is being poured on everything, whether it's our work life, our family life, coming from our clients, coming from our boss. And so the book is a practical guide on how do we manage urgency. Not only how do we set proper boundaries, but how do we properly create urgency when we need to. So I wrote the book for you. I can't wait for you to get a copy. Thanks, Brandon. Don't forget to check out The Hot Sauce Principle, available now on Amazon.com. Back to the show. Hey, welcome back from break. Of course, this is the Workplace Therapist Podcast. And today we've been talking about candor. And so right before the break, uh, my good colleague and friend Randy Hain and I were talking about candor. And Randy, you kind of set this up as open, honest, and direct. We talked about all the reasons why we have to have it. Mm -hmm. Talked about all the reasons why we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And you started us down the path of how do we do this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about how do you do it when you, you gave a great kind of final tip right before break. Start with the colleagues you already have trust with mm -hmm. and try it there. Um, I want to move into those relationships that we just maybe haven't built trust with. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's like a, it could be a new, new direct report or someone on our team reports to us or, or a new colleague. I mean, we, any way you want to slice it, but someone new. So we, let's like, let's take tension out of it for a minute, sure. but just someone new. How do you, how do you start candor in those relationships where you don't have trust fully built? You know, if you think about the experiences that you and I have every week, we are really probably pretty good practitioners of this because we're always meeting people where we need to establish trust pretty quickly. You know, we're thrust into situations where we're getting to know coaching clients and we have to get to trust quickly. Yeah. So um, we both have our own ways of doing it. The way that I do it, and this may be the answer to your question, is something that I call Haynes rules. So very simple, very simple rules. So one is when I'm working with someone that I don't know very well, um, if they get to know me, they're going to know that I'm always candid, but they don't know that at the beginning and I need to get to candor quickly. So I am going to ask permission to be candid. Brandon, I want to share an observation with you about something I saw in the meeting yesterday. Are you open to hearing what I've got to say? And here's what happens. Uh, by the way, in 23 years of doing this, no one's ever told me no. No one's ever said, no, you can't be candid ever. <laughs> so they always say yes. But what happens is we enter into a bit of a psychological contract. I was respectful and I asked permission. You have given permission. Now, you may not be excited, maybe you're a little nervous, but you know that, okay, he, he let me know it's coming. Then I have the responsibility to deliver that message in a kind, respectful way. So you've given me permission, now I have to tell you what I have to say. But again, I have responsibility to be kind and respectful. So that's one way when you need to give candid feedback is to ask permission. The other side of Haynes' rule is to also give people permission to be candid with you. Now, I don't mean this in a general sort of walk out of a meeting and say, you guys can tell me what you're thinking anytime and walk out the door. That's not what I'm talking about. It's with Brandon, who is a new colleague, and I'm getting to know him. And I say, Brandon, listen, um, I'm trying to work on my own leadership. I'm trying to get better as a whatever. Um, I would love to hear from you. If you've got candid insights for me about things that I could work on, I would love to hear from you. Again, I'm always interested in growing and learning. Please tell me if you ever see anything that you think I could work on, I would benefit from your insight. So giving sincere permission to give feedback, but also being courteous and asking for permission to give feedback. Haynes rule works here. And this could be something people could use to establish that trust faster. Yeah, I love that. So in the um, process of asking for permission, mm -hmm. do you also try and explain why you're wanting to give the feedback, the intent behind it? You know, um, I think sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Usually the situation and the context are pretty obvious. You know, so let's say that, um, again, I'm, 
I'm not a leader of a team in a company, but I'm sometimes in meetings or in situations where I have observed something. And it's very normal and natural for me to say, um, hey, Bill, you know, we're getting to know each other, but I wanted to kind of give you some feedback on something I saw. Can I have your permission to share some insights? Now, I don't do that every time, but usually the first time when I'm giving that kind of insight, I do it. Um, and you know me, and you and I, we're the same way. Um, we have, I have calm voice. You have a calm voice. We're reassuring. You know, we don't get really angry or frustrated. We're usually pretty cool guys, and we're sharing insight. So we're not, we're not threatening. And that's another thing to think about: your body posture and your temperament when you mm. give feedback. Uh, if you're hot, if you're angry, don't give feedback. Just avoid it. Walk away from it. Why? Don't do it because. If your barometer is rising and you're trying to give feedback, it's very hard to keep anger out of it, frustration out of it, emotions out of it. And I think that candor needs to be delivered in an emotionally neutral way if possible because people pick up on tone. And if they hear that you're frustrated or angry, they start to get anxious, nervous, and quite frankly may start to tune you out. Yeah, I think that's such an important point that I hadn't thought of, but it's so true. Mm-hmm. Um, often when I'm working with clients, I'll say, you know, you, while passion and energy is good, mm-hmm. if we if it raises too high, people only hear the emotion. Mm-hmm. They don't hear the, the substance. Mm-hmm. They'll leave the meeting and they'll say, gosh, he was really mad. Well, what did he say? I don't know, but he was really mad. Yeah. And so if you really want that message to be heard, I think you make a really important point. Mm-hmm. It's got to be delivered in a very calm, neutral way so emotion doesn't, mm-hmm. it's not heard. The message is heard. There's something else that I want to make sure that we don't uh, overlook. Notice when I talked about, you know, asking permission and giving that feedback. Notice at the end I said, so I've observed this. um, This is what you might consider. How can I help you? How can I support you to get better? Uh, What can I do to help you in this effort? It's really important for us not just to be the, the leaders or the teammates that walk around and just poke holes in everything that we see. We have to be willing to be part of the solution. Um, and that's another key aspect of this. Candor is great, but you have to be willing to be part of the solution. And I think a lot of people forget that step. You know, yeah. hey, you know what, Brandon, if you would just work on this, you'd be amazing. I've got to leave now. Take care. You know, that's not effective. Yeah, it's, you know, what I like about that, too, is even though you, you said earlier, sometimes you, you'll state your intent. This mm-hmm. is why you're giving the feedback. Sometimes you won't. Mm-hmm. Um, it always comes out if you do, if you do it that way. Uh-huh. Because they know at the end it's about them. You're trying to help them. You're trying to help them grow. It's mm-hmm. not about you. You're not giving it because you just want to, you know, drop a grenade in the room and walk out. And, and there are a lot of ways that we can lay the groundwork for this. I mean, we're still on this topic of how do I build trust early? Sometimes being vulnerable and saying, listen, I have always benefited in my career from people that took the time to give me candid feedback. If you don't mind, Brandon, I'd love to give you some insights about something I observed because I know it's always benefited my career. So the vulnerability of that, the humility of that, that I have learned and grown because people took the time to tell me things uh, is another great lead in and it builds trust quickly. Yeah, I love that. So modeling it, man, all great tips, Randy. Um, and also I could see where, you know, if you do this really well with your team and your circle, mm-hmm. you know, it almost starts to become a common practice. Yes. Part of the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, it, when it becomes more of a, a common practice or, or a, a process, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's not taken personal. Mm-hmm. I love that. I've always heard that saying before. So process, it's not personal. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of become, make it like a norm. All right. So for our last topic around this, how do you bring candor into senior team meetings? Because you and I both know <laughs> most majority of the senior teams we work with uh, are really reluctant to be candid with each other. Mm-hmm. And it causes them to not be as nearly as connected or as efficient as they could be. How do you do that? You'll appreciate this perspective because I think it starts with relationships. So let's tie it back to relationships for a minute. So, um, and I assume that your question is about if you're a leader on a senior team, not just coaches coming in to work with a senior team. Right, right. You're you're a leader. You're a you're a CXO, yes. right? And you're on a team with other CXOs. Yes. Like, how do you how do you make sure you all are really aligned and connected and can be honest, and hold each other accountable, mm-hmm. have some of those conversations, which you and I know are very rare at that level. And the hidden truth to what you're saying is that it is rare to find um, candor at that level necessarily. It it exists in pockets, but it's kind of hard to find it as a group. So here's what I would encourage a leader that wants to be candid with that group to do. Start with relationships. Get to know people one-on-one. Make the investment. Uh, I know right now in the age of COVID, it may seem difficult. Do whatever you can to get on the phone, get on a Zoom call, and get to know people. Get to know them personally and professionally. If if it wasn't 
COVID times, what would you recommend? Oh, uh, let's go grab coffee. Let's get lunch. Yeah. Uh, let's get a beer. I mean, whatever it takes. But find a way to build a professional and personal relationship where you take each other's measures, where you tell each other your stories. You and I love storytelling. You know, get just get it, get in that that sort of mindset. I need to get to know you because once I do and you get to know me, that is going to be a fertile ground where candor can take root. So I think if you start with relationships and then start to approach people, you know, both individually and in the team setting uh, with more candor, first of all, they're going to know where you're coming from. I didn't like what Brandon just said, but you know what? I've gotten to know that guy. I trust him. I, I know he probably had my best intentions at heart. Now, much like earlier when I said we own the responsibility for being respectful and kind, we have to be thoughtful if we're senior leaders watching the show and we want to start practicing more candor. Be careful not to do any gotcha moments. Those are That's where candor goes to die. If you have a gotcha moment and you're trying to score points off someone. What's an example for people who are listening? When you think of a gotcha moment, what's a what would be an example of a gotcha moment? So, hey guys, listen, I know that we missed our numbers last quarter, and if Brandon and his sales team had just done what they said they were going to do, we wouldn't have had oh, this so issue. in the meeting with everybody uh-huh. else, you just That's you gotcha single moment. somebody out and you throw them under the bus. Now, I may have been 100% correct, but how do you think Brandon feels? Brandon, you know, not good. Right. So, candor can be misused that way. So, let's be careful about, you know, maybe a different statement would be, hey, listen, guys, we're all struggling right now, and I know it's challenging, but we made some commitments in our last staff meeting, and I just want to encourage all of us to do a better job of living up to what we said. My team's got some work to do. I don't know about the rest of you, but I can tell you my team's got some work to do. Let's just do better at honoring commitments. It's a little bit like I'm falling on my sword. I'm admitting that I'm not perfect. I'm giving you a chance to chime in with, you know, maybe I didn't do my job either. But be careful about the gotcha moments. It's interesting. It made me think of, uh, I've heard often heard that the Blue Angel the flying group, the Blue Angels, when they end a mission, the way they debrief is everyone, every pilot has to go around and talk about and mention at least one thing they missed. Hmm. So they go around and they and that kind of creates that opportunity. But you're but also it creates that space because you're you're not you're not saying I'm perfect. Mm-hmm. You're saying this is the stuff I could have done better or differently. Mm-hmm. Um, so just another way to kind of you know work that in so it's more comfortable. Mm-hmm. There, there's one other way to do this, um, and I don't, I don't want to go tangential. I'll, I'll try to be brief. But there's a, a, a tool that um, I think I've shared with you before that I share with my clients called a success matrix. In essence, it's this idea that if I'm in a senior level executive team meeting, maybe I propose that we work through the problem by starting with future state success. Like, what does it look like if we get this right, guys? What does it look like if we solve the problem? What is the future? And then we work backwards by identifying, we agree on what success is, what are the obstacles, what can we do to eliminate the obstacles, and who's accountable for um, those those plans. So it's this it's it's an idea of creating a conversation where we're talking about solving the problem and we're not necessarily getting into who did what, when, and where. Uh, it, it sort of takes the personal stuff out of it and makes it more about solving the problem. That's a great way to create a candid conversation that's very productive. Yeah, I love that. It kind of takes the focus off of the individual to yeah. the goal of the group. Yes. Right? Or the goal of the team or the goal of the company. Yes. Versus individually. So it becomes, you know, I'm a I'm a we're all part of the same team trying to achieve this thing. Do you remember earlier you asked a great question and this is we're kind of coming full circle to it. You asked, you know, what's the connection between, you know, maybe bad or dysfunctional business meetings and candor? This is an example. So you started out by talking about how do we bring more candor into senior leadership teams? Well, if you're thinking about meetings, one of the ways that we can do it that I I rarely see done is we need to start being thoughtful about having a scribe in those meetings and taking notes, but also being clear about accountability. When you're on record as saying, I'm going to deliver the widget by August the 1st at noon, and that's in the notes, and then we re- we capture those notes and send them out to everyone, it creates an environment where it's easier to be candid because we're on record as committing to something. But what happens in a lot of the meetings you and I attend and we deal with this all the time, there's this ambiguity and this warm and fuzziness and, hey, Brandon promised by early August he's going to get that widget made. Well, that's not that's where we have a problem with candor. We're not really holding people accountable. And if we did more of that, again, memorialize the meeting, capture the, capture the notes, got it back to everyone, that might be one of the things that we can encourage if we want to bring more candor to our team environment. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes, makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. So we're starting to end our time today already. I can't believe it. It's flown by. So um, 
just because we didn't quite talk about this, but um, as we think about future state, hmm? why is candor so important for senior teams? When a senior team does it well, what does it unlock? You know, I think if I think about some of the teams I know that actually do a pretty good job with this, and there are some, I don't want to be all negative, you know, today, there are definitely some that do it well. I think those are the teams that um, are the most efficient. So they don't waste time. They have the right conversations at the right time. They're not having three conversations to get to one. So I think efficiency is important. Um, there are the teams that typically um, hit their goals. They're the ones that excel. They perform better because, again, they're not wasting time. Think about the, the, the inefficiency that's associated with lack of candor. Uh, we, don't want to, we just don't want to have the direct conversation so we avoid it and it causes problems. I think those are the teams that are most creative. They're willing to fail in front of each other. They'll fail fast in front of each other. They don't, they don't worry about saying something stupid in front of their colleagues. Hey, listen, I've got an idea. What do you think? And they put things up against the wall. They see what sticks and they move on. So that's another aspect of teams that really embrace candor and do it well. Um, I think the other thing is uh, these are the teams that typically um, are really focused on growth. Each individual leader wants to grow, and they know the only way that they can grow is that they have honest conversations with each other. So we could go on and on, but those are some of the things that I see. You know, what I um, find ironic in all this Uh is you let off with efficiency Mm -hmm. and then all these other aspects of efficiency Mm -hmm. and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And I think what holds people back on the senior teams of doing it is they feel like the the process of investing in the relationships feels inefficient. Yes. Right? It's inefficient for me to spend all this time having lunches and coffees and Mm -hmm. talking about personal life. I got work to do. Yeah. I'm just going to focus on my group and do that work. So they don't, it feels inefficient. And yet if they invest in that, it will lead to greater efficiency later Mm -hmm. is kind of your point, which I think is an important reminder. It's going to feel awkward, but you're going to end up yielding better results. This is going to feel maybe Freudian or something else, but a really interesting way to look at this is if you will think about before you say anything, do anything, if you think about every action, everything that comes out of your mouth, always remember there's another person or people on the other end of that. So there is a ripple effect of your actions, thoughts, and words. So whatever you do is going to impact someone. So think about before you say or or do anything, What is it that I want to accomplish? How do I need to show up? What's going on in that person's world? I need to live in their head for just a minute and think about that. And if we would do that, that's another way to maybe bring candor to life because, well, gosh, I need to, I need to get something done with Bill and I need to be honest with him because that's how I'd like to be treated. But what I just described, which seems really easy when we're busy and very focused on tasks that never gets done. We never do that. So maybe just pausing and thinking about, I need to have a conversation or send a memo or do something. What is it that I want to get done on the other end? What's the, what's the goal? And sometimes if we'll do that, I can tell you when, it, when I do it, it's, it's much more effective. I am able to show up better and be more candid and respectful and do all the things that I need to do as a leader. So maybe just pausing and reflecting and living in the moment would be a good, helpful tip here. Yeah, and trying to put yourself in the other person's yeah, shoes, a little sure. empathy, curiosity. Uh-huh. Think about how, how, what either what pain or, or challenges they might be encountering um, or how they might view the message. But that ties right back into your point about relationships because in order for me to get something done with Brandon, I need to get to know him better and we need to have trust and we need to have a relationship. If we'll pause and think about why do I need to invest time here, that would be the answer. Well, if I invest time, I'm going to get these great things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Randy, awesome. I mean, this is one of those kind of those golden nuggets that you and I both know. If you could master mm-hmm. this and spread it throughout a team mm-hmm. or even an organization, it's tremendously powerful and makes everything better. Mm-hmm. Efficiency, innovation, healthier conversations and, and winning. I mean, mm-hmm. you win, which is great. Like why else? Why? I mean, that's not enough. You know, yes. it's definitely a good, good calls to action. So um, I ask all my guests this question, mm-hmm. although now we're tweaking it a little bit with our new kind of focus for the show. So what's one life hack you have for us to help us have either better conversations at home or at work mm-hmm. or improve our relationships at home or at work? I hope this suits your purpose, um, but I want to connect it back to candor for just a minute. So to your point a minute ago about we're all so busy, we're racing around, we're, we're doing our checklist. One of the things that we always need to be mindful of, and I know this seems simple, is when you try to deliver candor in an email or a text or some other 
form of not in-person communication, it never works out well. People will always read emotion into it. They will misinterpret your words. So the point I'm making is if you're going to be candid with a colleague, do it in person. Now in the age of COVID, that's difficult. Then get on the phone. That's a, that's a decent backup, not my favorite. I'd rather do it in person. But the idea of if you're going to practice candor, do it in person. It's, uh, it's going to be a way for your words to not necessarily be misinterpreted. Uh, it's a more respectful, kinder way to do it. So that's the hack I'd offer you is make sure that you never deliver candor via email or text. It will never work out I well for you. I think it's an important, important point and kind of goes back to that saying that I love in the absence of communication, people assume the worst. Absolutely. And I love that you extended that and said they'll read emotion into it. Oh, yeah. Even though you might have, there was no emotion when you wrote it, they'll make it up in their mind. And, oh, he's yelling and screaming at me. You know what gets me in trouble? I am a minimalist. My emails are super short. It would be a miracle if you got more than three sentences out of me because I will read your email and you may send me a book. But if I just, if, if all you need from me is that sounds good, I'm going to respond with that sounds good. Now I'll say good morning and hope you have a great weekend. But people will call me sometimes and say, are you okay? Are you mad? Are you upset? No, I just didn't need to respond <laughs> to your book with a book, you know? Uh, so anyway, it gets me in trouble sometimes. I, I get it. Um, so if people want to learn more about your work and the work that you do, uh, where can they go? Uh, go to serviumpartners.com. Uh, I'm a pretty active blogger, so uh, all my thought leadership stuff is there. Um, you can re- read my books. I- I'm an author as well. How they're many all, books have you put out now? Uh, seven. Yeah. Uh, they're on Amazon. And um, Leadership Foundry, uh, I guess we can tease people with, uh, we have a new website coming out, hopefully in the next yeah. 30 to 45 days. And we're going to have some great stuff there. So MyLeadershipFoundry.com. MyLeadershipFoundry.com. So my, don't forget, you got to use, use the opening my. Yes. MyLeadershipFoundry.com. So hopefully you'll go there in the future and find thought leadership from both of us. So uh, yeah. we're really excited about that. Yeah, very excited about that. More, yeah. more to come on that for sure. Yes. Uh, well, Randy, awesome. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on the show Thanks again. Me. I mean, so always so valuable every time you come on and all the insights you give. But this was particularly relevant for kind of where we're at because this is something we can all improve at is candor, mm-hmm. both at work, but even at home. I mean, we can all find ways to get more honest, open and direct. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, thank you for listening and watching the show. If you aren't um, listening to it on iTunes, please um, subscribe, rate and review. That's how more folks find the show. Uh, and if you want more resources uh, and find prior episodes of the show, you can go to the workplacetherapist.com and you can find plenty of other resources. And if you haven't bought a copy of my book, uh, what are you waiting for? You should go buy a copy. So until our next show, have a great week and an awesome life. 